Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, the Invisible Man. We learn how to apply army sniper secrets to hunting situations. We've got the regulars, hunting YouTube, new stump. First, Andy Crow is making light work of rabbits. Light work, get it? The last time we tried to go rabbiting with Messrs Dom and Crow, it all went a bit Pete Tong. When we arrived, Crow stuffed his knee up by falling out of a tractor. He refused to go to hospital and despite the pain, went rabbiting. We saw two rabbits all night, which is why that outing never made it onto the programme. Six months later, we're back. Crow's leg is still rubbish, but when he's got a new chariot like this green bead machine, it helps the pain a little. Crow is not the only one with a shiny toy, although he could certainly do with a new buggy. Dom has made some changes to his anchors. I found it too long, especially when I was shooting from the vehicle, to comfortably get in and out of the, of the, uh, of the truck window. And speaking to Chris Blackburn at UK Gunworks, we came up with the ideas like, well, what difference will it make? What I didn't want was to compromise the performance of the rifle just for the sake of getting something that was a bit shorter and a bit more wieldy. And he thought it'd make for an interesting experiment. You know, there's, there's a lot of different barrel lengths available uh, on a rimfire. Actually, how much difference does it make? Um, so we went to the range with an angle grinder, with a chronograph, with a load of ammunition, and we set about reducing it and measuring it and seeing how it performed. Um, uh, the results of which we'll be writing about uh, in an upcoming issue of the magazine. But as you can see, there's no going back. You can't really stick it back on once it's done. So here it is in its new improved carbine form. Um, and we're gonna give it a go tonight on the bunnies. So with a wheezing buggy, a stumpy rifle, and a crow with a peg leg, the dream team head off on the lookout for the bunnies. Once again, the pressure is on Dom to deliver. Crow doesn't like to let opportunities slip away, but some bunnies just don't do what they're supposed to. Dom is finding the rabbits, but a miss means Crow takes over for a field or two. They're all within the typical range for a 1.7 HMR, but then he shoots this rabbit at more than 100 yards. The wind is critical in this situation. It's a still night, otherwise Crow wouldn't have considered it. The 1.7 HMR has become much more popular in recent years. It's got better range, faster, flatter. Lots of positive things, frangible bullets, no ricochets or less chance of ricochet, etc., etc. But it does have a bit of an Achilles heel in windy conditions. Yeah. Andy, yes. talk us through it. You can be along a hedgerow, there'll be no wind at all. You smack one rabbit and then you go onto one about 70, 80 yards out in the field. There might be wind out there and it just blows it off. And anyone that's got one will know that. Close range out to say 50, 60 yards, you don't get much movement on it. You, you will get some, but you won't get a lot. It's horses for courses though, isn't it? Because some people say, oh, you know, two twos are better round. Some people say, I swear by the one seven. But each of them have certain things that, that they're really good at and certain things that, that you have to compromise on. So, you know, in an ideal world, you'd have, you'd have one of each in your gun safe, but, you know, realistically <laughs> for most of us, um, it's not possible. Yeah, the one seven, I, I swear by it. I really do, I love it. I think it's a good round, it's a safe round as well. The sight of the battery and jump leads in the back doesn't inspire confidence. But the buggy keeps chugging along and the bunny bag is growing. Halfway through the night, we change lamps. No real reason, it's just to explore the merits of each. Certainly for Dom, the beam of the Nightmaster means he can pinpoint that rabbit straight away. We've been using the tack light, which is a big favourite of Andy and of Roy. It gives a massive range and a very, very tightly focused beam. Um, it's an impressive performance for a compact torch, it's really easy to use. And when you're once you've found the light beam through the scope, you've found the rabbit because it's such a narrow beam, you know that's where it's going to be. For scanning large grass fields like we have been doing tonight, the limitation is that because it's such a narrow beam, it is easy to miss stuff, especially when it's sitting tight in, in quite long grass or in the crops. Um, and we also switched over after a while to the traditional light force lamp, which is what I, you know, I used when I started lamping and is used for years and years and years. And it is absolutely brilliant for scanning. It's got a very, very wide beam not quite so much reach as the tack light, um, but good for covering large distances. 
what I noticed in comparison to the tack light was you have to kind of recalibrate, you have to keep much more of a, a focus on where the rabbit is because you can't just rely on, oh, there's the red light, there's the rabbit because it's covering so much more distance. Um, but both, both very good. I have to say, I really like the, the light, light force type lamp. Really, really good for this kind of thing, for swinging around the field and seeing what's what. Um, but I can see why the modern LED, Cree LED lights have become so popular. Um, you know, they, they give remarkable performance for a small package. Be like yourself. Considering we were only out for an hour and a half, we haven't done too badly with 50 rabbits, relieving a bit of pressure from the crops. This time last year we were way behind. The rate was probably two inches in the good places and wasn't even thinking about flowering. And this year, well... We, we shot in this exact same field yeah, we did. last year, yeah. a month later than now, yeah. and it was virtually bald, wasn't it? Yeah, it, was hard. it wasn't even coming in flower. It was coming, but it wasn't in flower. Uh, the field next door, that's probably four foot tall. Um, it's had two growth regulators on it. It's still about four foot tall um, and full flower. So, um, yeah, I just, like I say, I'm really looking forward to this summer's harvest because I think it's going to be a good one. Stumpy, limpy and wheezy did okay tonight. Bit of a miracle, really. Thank you, Andy, for that piece about lights. Now somebody else tripping the light fantastic. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. When US TV host Ellen DeGeneres joined a long queue of unqualified people to speak out against seal hunting, the Inuit hunters of Canada and Alaska hit back with seal fees. They have posted hundreds of photos known as seal fees showing off their seal skin fashion. DeGeneres has given money to the Humane Society of the United States, one of the most prominent critics of Canada's seal hunting. Now, have you ever seen a roosting fox? When Chris Pritchard took his girlfriend shooting, he spotted a fox 20 foot up a tree. It was the work of moments for him to take his gun and shoot it. It was on the top right-hand branch. Boring but important, there's another petition to allow handguns. It calls on the UK government to amend the Firearms Act to allow the ownership and use of 2.2 calibre rimfire pistols for competitive sporting purposes in England, Wales and Scotland. Visit firearmsuk.org forward slash unity to sign up. Prime Minister David Cameron did not allow a partial repeal of the ban of hunting with hounds last week. Pressure from his anti-hunting Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg led Cameron to drop plans to allow more than two hounds to flush animals including foxes, hares and mice. Rabbits and rats are not affected by the hunting ban. However, ministers want to issue a call for evidence on how to control foxes and other vermin while feeding on livestock in upland areas, so there may still be a vote. Alaskan lawmakers have come under fire for banning something that doesn't even happen. They've made it illegal to deploy drones for hunting purposes. Alaska wildlife troopers admit they have no evidence of drone-assisted hunting. Poachers are shooting storks in Malta and their shots are being captured on film. The birds belong to a flock of 13 storks which are being monitored by local animal rights groups. Police were unable to find either the dead storks nor the men who killed them. Australia has rejected a plan to offer trophy crocodile hunting. The Australian government said the suggested hunting of around 50 saltwater crocs across the Northern Territory wouldn't be appropriate, even though 500 salties are culled in the region every year. The plan was thrown out by Australia's Environment Minister, amusingly called Greg Hunt. And finally, an American police officer has uploaded a film of himself rescuing a frightened fawn which has got tangled up in Christmas tree lights. Yeah. New York State cop Kevin Sweet cut the lights away with a knife. He is now known as the deer hero in his local station and fellow officers have taped a picture of a deer onto his mailbox. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Next up, let's see what you lot have been up to. It is Hello Charlie. Here's what the world's up to this week. 
Hello Charlie, me and Shaggy here, just going out, doing a little bit of filming for my next piece for the shooting times and I've just been watching the channel this week. What's all this about me not smiling? There's an art to looking grumpy and being happy within, so if you don't know what a white head smile looks like, here we go, happy days. Hello Charlie, last day of the row season, I just had this lovely cold row dough, she had to be taken because she was a bit of a bad leg, so she had to go. Hello, Charlie. Bill from Arizona, fishing in Florida. Send us your own Hello Charlie. Film yourself on your mobile phone just a sentence saying Hello Charlie, who you are and what you're up to. Then share it or email it via YouTube, Facebook, Dropbox or you send it, you name it, to charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Please keep those Hello Charlies coming. Now we meet a man who's going to show us what it really takes to blend into the background. We've done stories about camouflage before. Some of it's serious, some of it's not so serious. Oh, where is he now? Today we are not out to knock camo, but show that, with a bit of thought and attention to detail, something we know little about at Field Sports Channel Towers, you can just disappear. Vital for many hunters. To prove just how effective it can be hidden somewhere in this shot is survival expert Dave Rofe with his rifle. Can you spot him? A few more seconds and reveal yourself Dave. There he is. Here's an easier one. Well done Dave. Dave runs Wood Oak Wilderness in Surrey, where anyone who wants to look without being seen can learn how. It's important not just to be hidden from the actual quarry that we're hunting, but also from all its other locations. You could be stalking a rabbit or a rat, but it's the blackbird that gives you away. The moment the blackbird sees you, he's shouting at the top of his beak that you're there, you're a danger. So the animals know the other animals' call signs and alert signs. Dave has a dozen different ghillie suits, something for every occasion, but they'll need fine tuning with fresh foliage when a location has been selected. Drooping is not a good look. So what are the basics, Dave? The principles of camouflage concealment can be covered under a simple five S's and the M. The five S's stand for shape, shine, shadow, silhouette and sound and the M is movement or sudden movement. There are a couple of other S's that I like to add to the list. One of them is statue, knowing when to freeze. And the other one is smell. You need to make sure that you don't put on the aftershave in the morning before you go on to the shoot. But your camouflage needs to be appropriate to the environment that you're operating in. It also needs to be appropriate to the weather environment. There's nothing worse than being all camouflaged up and the sun comes out and all you do is sweat bucket after bucket after bucket. And the other thing is, on a cold day, if you've not got the layers there, you try and hold a steady shot when you're shivering. You're just not going to take the meat home. Next week, we'll see Dave put his ghillie suits together, but today he's showing us how to conceal a rifle. For demo purposes, he's using an unloaded airsoft replica of the British Army L96A1 sniper rifle. If you wanted to be really fussy about the camouflage, if you take a look at the end of the muzzle on this rifle, it's a perfect round black dot. That will give you away if you've got an observer looking. The trick is to drape a piece of cloth, a small lightweight piece of cloth over the front, tied on at this point. When you pull the shot, the air being expelled from the barrel by the projectile will actually lift the flap up, the projectile will flop and then it'll drop back down again. So that will cover up that little telltale sign. And it's little things like that, attention to detail, that will get you spotted. When camouflaging up your barrel, you need to bear in mind that if you over camouflage it, you break the sight line from your scope. So you need to make sure that whatever camouflage is on the sides and the bottom, and you keep a relatively clear area in front, there's no point having a perfectly camouflaged rifle and you can't see out of it. I always keep ranger bands or rubber bands as they, call, as they are on my rifles. Just helps me to attach all the necessary netting and foliage that I need. To stop the lens from being a perfect round circle, just drape your net over the top of it, apply the band, and pull it tight. It will blur the vision fractionally, but not enough to make you not be able to see through it. Here's the critical point your working parts, be an air rifle, your cocking handle, 
You don't want to cover them over. It's one thing to take a shot, but if it's all covered over, that's it. You'll make more movement trying to reload. So keep these area clear. Once you're actually in position, your actual camouflage, your hat, your veil, and your ghillie suit will cover most of this. So this doesn't need to be camouflaged. Right, that is a basic camouflage, very quick. It's called a hasty camouflage, but it's enough. All I'm trying to do is break up the straight lines of the scope and the barrel. Looking from this side, it doesn't look much, but once you start to look at it straight on, it just becomes another bush. Dave gets paid for playing hide and seek as well as hunting and witnessing some wonderful wildlife moments. He is hired in to carry out covert surveillance operations like recording fly tippers in the act and inadvertently catching human beings in the act too. Yes, uh, far too many and probably inappropriate to discuss about. And incredibly outdoor antics are not reserved for the warmer times of the year. Uh, surprisingly not, it's uh, not seasonal. <laughs> in the winter there's less thing in nettles. The original Invisible Man was a book of science fiction by H.G. Wells published in 1897. A scientist called Griffin invents a way to change a body's refractive index to that of air so that it absorbs and reflects no light. He successfully carries out this procedure on himself but fails in his attempt to reverse it. Find out if Wood Oak Wilderness can do the same for you. Go to woodoak.co.uk now to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube. It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Jonathan McGee is putting out a web series about stalking in Hampshire in the south of England with Charlie Green of Shave Green Shooting Services. Charlie sends me Passion for Deer, part one of six, and I'm delighted to showcase it. While British cameramen are concentrating on lovely dappled light and calm professional stalkers, the American version is this. The bull elk charges the bow hunter in a video moment that could be sponsored by Andrex. More from the USA, viewer Jacob Fredstead sends in little girl experiences bug fever for the first time. Like a 21st century Judy Garland, she is wonderfully cute and on advice from a couple of professional mums, I don't doubt that it's real too. Now a couple of predator films from the USA. Eastern coyote hunting with AR-15 has the animal blindsided. And Realtree brings out its film about predator hunting in the open country of Arizona. They shoot a running coyote and then they set about finding it. A1 decoy is out after wild geese in Aberdeenshire. Despite Despite the proximity of an RSPB reserve, there was a time the presence of the RSPB was a guarantee of good shooting. They do well. Moving south, Safari Hunting UK is decoying pigeons in Yorkshire. It takes nearly two minutes to get to the action and the intro is a bit heavy on the word beautiful. Hey, we can see it's beautiful. You don't need to say it, but hang in there. There's a good story about pigeon shooting coming up. And finally, Hound Sports. This is a trailer for a folksy TV show, but if it is anything to go by, the show should be good. One man, his mule and a pack of hounds are after mountain lions, bears and bobcats. You can click on any of these films to watch them if you are missing the fishing films and the air gun films. Watch our new shows, Airheads and Fishing Britain. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. But if you didn't like any of those and you still want to sit and watch telly, why not look at some of our programmes? Airheads is out on Thursday the 3rd of April and we're focusing on the best baits. James Marchington turns his back garden into a test facility and discovers 8 out of 10 crows prefer... Well, you'll have to watch to find out. Click on the link on the screen to see all the Airhead series so far. And click on the link on the screen for Fishing Britain this week. We spend a sunny afternoon with internet angling sensations Carl and Alex fishing for a mixed bag of species and conversation. We reel in large carp, large tench, perch, rudd and a mighty gudgeon, all while chatting about what makes these new school fishing gurus tick. Plus, we head off to Wollaston Court Trout Lakes where Howell Morgan opens the next Vineyard 120 Challenge envelope. We are back next week, and if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button that's somewhere around the outside of the screen or go to our web page, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. This has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>